I didn't like this place. It's a great place. All right, we'll use that to just jump right in here. So welcome to Angry Cow Poetry in the Rialto Living Room. Thank you. Pleasure to have all of you here. We have a great night coming up for you. If you were here last week, we had a fabulous feature, Danielle Nicole Nikki Dixon. If you were not here yet last week, it is all recorded. You can catch that online as well. You can go to angrycowpoetry.com slash shows, or just go to Angry Cow Poetry and find shows in the upper menu. And you can see in Danielle's entire set, she was incredible. So. Uh, we have two amazing features tonight as well. Two features today, two for the price of one. So we are very, very glad you're here. A uh, couple things coming up. I'll go ahead and announce just so we know. We have the next two features for Angry Cow Poetry in the Alto Living Room are set. Sept uh, August feature is next. Exposure is going to be our feature poet in August, who's an amazing local poet here. And in September, Raja Bell Freeman is going to come down from Cleveland and join us. So. Hope you come back for both of those. Also at the Rialto this week, tomorrow night, Jim Ballard with special guest Zach is going to be performing at 5 o'clock on this stage in the living room here. Welcome, whoever's walking in the door. Nobody's Nobody's walking walking in. In. It's an event now, Nobody's here. All right, fantastic. Glad to have you, Welcome, Billy. On Saturday night, Zach and myself and Gretchen Plus coming back from Michigan are going to be on the main stage for a mixture of poetry and music, which is going to be a special night as well. So please, please come back. We have two features tonight. They're local Akron poets, and I'm Northeast Ohio as well. And I actually met them, I don't know if you remember this or not, I actually met you in Chicago. It's the yeah. first time we met in a line, I think it was Vegan Mania, yeah. something out that way. Um, and it was just someone I knew, someone I was with, knew you, and we just connected. I was like, they're awesome, and you know, found much more about them since. So Steve Brightman is going to be our first poet. Steve lives in Akron with his wife, Teresa, and their parents. Uh, during the, wa the vast wilderness uh, that is the COVID era, he published a full-length collection of his poems titled The Circus of His Bones, which is here tonight and available for purchase. His first full-length feature collection, his first full-length collection, uh, The Wild Gospel of Careening and Other Sermons from the Rumble Strip, was released in the before days of 2015. I'm also going to call Steve out on this, too. This is what he gave me for a bio. But Steve, <laughs> yeah, it happens. So Steve went through a series of years where Steve wrote a poem every single day. Ten years. What was the final number? 3652. 3652. Consecutive days of writing a poem every single day, which is one of the most amazing feats in poetry that I've seen. And they were good, too. Like, I read them, I post them online. Like, it's something like, I just got to get a poem in. And I'd still be like, wow, <laughs> like, that was a day's work. And like, boom. So, uh, Steve, his most recent chapbooks are Leaving the Flatlands to the Amateurs, History 2 is a Simple Machine, and 13 Ways of Looking at Lou Reed. He's got at least one fe the feature book, The Circus of Bones, with him in one chapbook. If you're willing to help support our amazing features, you can purchase one of those. If you're willing to put a suggested $5 donation, you can hand it to me and put it in a little thing up on the table or put it on the table over there, wherever. It certainly helps so I can pay the features. That's all of the money goes directly to them. If you do throw in anything to the pot, we greatly appreciate it. So without further ado, Steve Brightman, give him a great welcome, please. Can everybody hear me all right without the mic? Yeah. All right, because sometimes I hear my own voice and it, freaks, <laughs> it kind of freaks me the fuck out. Excuse my language. Um, yeah, so I wrote 3,652 poems in a row, and I don't really know what I expected to do with it once I started, but I started, and now here I am. Get the one bonus that I got from that is that it gave me an enormous amount of poetry to kind of <laughs> compile books from. And so this first one that I'll be reading from tonight is Leaving the Flat Lanes to the Amateurs. And most of the poems in this I wrote, uh, for lack of a better way to describe this, under the influence of listening to Robert Pollard and Guided by Voices. Really short poems really kind of just hammer a point home and then fly on to the next one. So I'm going to rip through these pretty quick. And you are. Unplugged began with her, a dark dream day sleeper. You missed the sun and moon. Westward jet flung, you are star strung, you are sky hung. She is calling you and you are calling back soon. Unplugged began with her, jet flung moon, and you are calling the sun too soon. She is calling you and you are calling back the sun too soon. 
Queen Anne's lace is the only loudest magic. Leaves so thick, sun is but one candle. Never understood some folks need for the ripcord handle. Never understood, never understood, the devil I know, the leather of Jesus' sandals. Never understood, never understood, never understood, the fist, the flower, or scapegoat vandal. Sun is but one candle. Oh, we did right. I appreciate that, but you don't have to applaud after everyone because I've got a lot going on. <laughs> Blackberries in glass. Lock on bolts, sets free the caffeine distract. Judges wear deaf ears to all their parties. Blackberries in glass are the strongest voice out there. A snap of long fingers and blackberries in glass. Behind red mad. Sparrows follow hollow bones to water edge, setting fire to salt. Lights the night sky, burying faces behind red mad draperies and disguises, setting fire to night, lights street and eyes, sparrows follow anyone home. Autopilot. Turning key sounds like falling tree, sounds like lemon pepper caterwaul, sounds like my emptiest promise, sounds like autopilot in reverse, sounds like one icicle melting. I am unfolding and the speedometer is more patience than velocity. Metal versus flesh is never a fair fight like autopilot in reverse. Thank you. Um, these next few poems were inspired by an exhibit at the Akron Art Museum a few years back by an artist uh, named June Kaneko. Um, most of his work was untitled, which was both promising and troublesome to me. Promising because it let me fill in a lot of the blanks, but it was also troublesome because it didn't really give me any direction to what I was looking at. So since he didn't give me any direction, <laughs> I took my own direction. <laughs> And I took a lot of the untitled poems and I wrote poems inspired by the Greek gods, or where the Greek gods were the main characters in the poems inspired by the pieces of art, yeah, whether they be paintings or whether they, they be sculptures. Depending on your perspective, Hades took up residence south and west of Olympus by either a few feet or a few miles. Wind is howl, is half-spoken secret, is heaven, is tassel of pretty hair, is lack of escape plan, is sunflower charade, is steady decline, is guitar string tuned to the key of your last lover, is disregard for law, is three rivers plus two, is silver, is solitude, is silver, is stone, is silver, is solitude, is silver, is stone, is silver. Poseidon beckons the sea into the sky, in order to obscure the stars, thus rendering navigation useless. Polaris dresses herself as mirage, as quiet catastrophe, as first lost night of 3000, as mirage, as green valley memory, as salted prayer, as withered wrist, as knife blade and sail, as mirage, as wind, as true north bleeding into south, as lover's voice, as mirage. Apollo taught men the unholy practice of whispering to the cruel and benign ghosts in their blood, and he called it light, and he called it truth. Resolute breastplate protects fluid heart with fervor and discipline. Ashen songs recited towards stratosphere push aside remedy, push aside folklore, push aside reverence for forefathers. Um, these next poems are going to be uh, from my latest full length, the Circus of His Bones. Um, you've probably heard me read them online if you've heard me read anything from this book. Um, there are three main voices in this book. Um, the voice of the serpent and, of course, the voices of Adam and Eve. Um, I try to turn the conventional mythology on its ear a little bit. Um, and, well, here's where we're at. Um, there are six, excuse me, there are five poems by the serpent in the serpent's voice. And they are a series of poems that are daisy chained together, where there's a phrase or a line in the poem, in the first poem that is also repeated in the second poem. There's a second line or a different line in the second poem that's repeated in the third, and eventually in the fifth one, there's a line that's repeated in the first one. So all six, all five poems go in, in a circular, um, in a circular motion. Serpent announces the first Beth, first birth of Adam. All good myths begin with a bird or a human far too curious or callous, 
and sometimes mistaken by a distracted and careless manner of youth well before they realize the expense of free. Past, present, and future are all visible at once. Once upon a time, plus once upon a midnight dreary, plus once upon a dream, plus once upon a child, this is the adding machine where Adam was born. Serpent announces the second birth of Adam. Feathered things escape upon air faster than an eye blink. Forestry is good for cover, but only until nightfall. All good myths begin with a bird or a human, but darkness brings a different predator. Rugged foliage serves as his swaddling clothes. The scruff of his neck still has loose enough skin for carrying one clenched jaw from the Donner Party. This is the food chain where Adam was born. Serpent announces the third birth of Adam. Or third birth. <laughs> Every family tree is gigantic in the dark, and his deceased are warriors still. They have dispatched themselves to fetch each daybreak, to set it at his feet, and to never tire. At first he doesn't notice the ghosts in his periphery, but he gradually reacquaints himself with faces and forgotten voices, cocks his head, and steps nearer. They remind him of their ancient warmth. He barely takes note when he becomes one of them. Darkness brings a different predator. He starts to fetch daylight because they taught him to do so. This is the unassuming recruitment program where Adam was born. Serpent announces the fourth birth of Adam. Rainwater ends every one of its busy days soaking deep into their crooked dirt like ghosts in the periphery, never once forgetting the science behind the lift and the fall. All the while, morning sits idly by, smelling of earthworms and green grass and deep fruit that refuses to ripen. This is a condensation where Adam was born. Serpent announces the final birth of Adam. Past, present, and future are all visible at once. They align with the sun this time of year, scald their dislocation into ugly remnants upon the earth, soaking deep into their crooked dirt. Muscle and bone disentangle into a bouquet of days wilting around him. Past, present, and future are all visible at once. This is the triptych where Adam was born. Thank you. The next uh, poem or series of poems are The Voices of Eve, and they're titled uh, Number of Songs, Songs 1 through, uh, how many are there? Well, Songs 1 through 12, sorry, I lost count. Um, I didn't realize this when I was writing them, but they served, the, they served very well as a series. Um, they were meant to be individual songs and are spaced that way throughout the book. Um, but when you read them, or when I read them as uh, one long poem, um, it works well with the repetition, I think. Eve sings to their offspring. Song one. Daughters and sons, the voice of your mother was the first voice you knew. Summer turning into fall is the beta version of your bones decaying, dressed for the occasion. Leaves are shiny on one side and the other side is built for thirst. Tomorrow may be the last full day without another headstone in your life. Take full advantage of easy breathing and your soft, comfortable middle. Absent any hunger pains, desire can rot you from the inside out, and you will not see any bruising until well after it is too late. Song 2. Daughters and sons, keep both eyes open for intersections. See them for what they are. Yellow lights are a caution. Only while you are driving, the sun is a yellow dwarf. While you are sitting here breathing, and some dead folks are dead folks because someone couldn't see anything but red. Song three, daughters and sons, the shelf life of magic decreases exponentially in sunlight. Do not fall in love with the iron and electricity in your own blood. Science is reckless with the human heart. Math, too, has abandoned anything resembling organs or bones. Your spine can keep you upright only until you notice that it is doing so. Daughters and sons, the sun and the air are liars. Warm is as much a religion as an insurgency is. Hastily scribbled on the nearest piece of anything which resembles a flat surface, this does not make anger a house of worship. Your body is a temple, your neighbor's body is a temple too. Daughters and sons, say your hellos, goodbye to each other. Remind yourselves that the desert is a desert for a reason. There is no need to walk through it just because it is there. Remind yourselves that the ocean is an ocean for a reason. Don't expect your friends to meet you every time you come up for air. Some days you have to swim for your lives and it's hard damn work remembering which body of blue is sky and which is water. Daughters and sons, don't confuse your medicine with your healing. Your skin doesn't have to be a small cacophony of demons. Expose yourself to natural light and remember that the mythology behind everything, 
everything probably came from the voice of a man who was angry at the gods because his power was not as vast as he had hoped. Mm -hmm. Daughters and sons, do not be a friend of the dollar sign. Do not either make it an enemy. Know that it can be both a bludgeon and a scalpel, <laughs> depending only upon who it is doing the wielding. Remember, every maiden name on your mother's side, remember how your father died. Daughters and sons, civilized life has made progress. We no longer believe that we lose fundamental pieces of our wretched souls simply from having our photograph taken. We are now owned by phones which unlock upon our eager, garish faces. Yours has never been a world without electronics, without GPS, without camera lenses pointing at you and from you. Having never not known this captivity, excavation is gray but necessary. You are the only ones who can dig yourselves out from underneath bones you will never know. Daughters and sons, regardless of your religion, sin at its core is an overwhelming failure to love the closest human to you. The closest skin to you is not the only skin in the game. Love the next one too, and the one after that. Daughters and sons, there are very few things in the world more troubling than extended silences. You should not let yourself become one. Your heart is as big as you need it to be. Remember how your skin zippers against the skin of your lover, closes dark space between you, turns it into almost light. Daughters and sons, cloud circles of crows will appear without notice sometimes. Show an applicable degree of awe. Even though this black mass will never know who you are, the face of God is not and never will be kaleidoscope or cotton white beard. Daughters and sons, glass can be as sharp as a knife, but it was sand or stone once. Once upon a time is no way to be 20 one day and 50 the next. 1995 is a quarter century rear viewed already. Ocean has never once in that time stopped pulverizing the jagged shore. Mm. These next couple, one, two, three, four poems are uh, in the voice of Adam, who is, rather than the main character of the Adam and Eve myth, um, kind of a bumbling interloper. Adam instinctively loses concern for the axis of why. It started deep within his genetics in places that weren't named yet, in places where ideas began at the most elemental level, and in places where predators thrive on the dark and tentative irons in the blood. Night is coming earlier now, and Adam doesn't understand the axis of why. He only knows that he is hungry, and you are close. Adam develops a tactile cruelty and discerning eye for negative space. Wide enough to see all the beautiful teeth in the mouth of the Nile, wide enough to unleash color upon the absence of color, and then add another shade, and then another just to be safe, wide enough to acknowledge saints were sinners who used to rely upon smoke to fill our young lungs when prayers sounded like forgeries upon our clumsy lips. Um, this poem is an Adam poem, but it didn't start as an Adam poem. It was originally an homage to my grandfather who was a carpenter and um, some things that he left behind when he passed. Um, Adam unbuilds a box. He identifies and attacks any and all nail holes. He unscrews and removes the hinged lid from the box. He removes the side of the box from the base. He unassembles the butt joints. He uncuts his boards. He unmeasures and unmarks his boards. He ignores his supplies. He returns wood into tree forms. He leaves the trees alone. He plants one more just to be safe. Adam remembers blue sky. Thank you. All right, and this is my last Adam poem. Um, it's titled, Adam Counts Out Loud to 1200. Breathing was easy for Adam until it wasn't. One morning he woke up and realized his earthly world had become a vice. Floorboards were a jaw, and roof was a jaw, and both were tightening the life from it. He poked holes in his lungs so he wouldn't suffocate. He let the nail of his pinky finger grow jagged and scratched a single line into his pleura as each day passed. One day became two, became three, became four, became 1,200, until there was no more unscratched surface. Every square inch was perforation, and just like that, there was no more counting to be done. Mm. This was, funnily enough, um, the last poem that I've submitted for publication and was published. It's a baseball poem, sort of. 
Um, the bottom, <laughs> yeah, the bottom reaches of heaven. Vita Blue was in green and gold, and that summer was our first communion. Vita Blue was in green and gold, and his right knee scraped the bottom reaches of heaven without asking for forgiveness. Vita Blue was in green and gold. Morning glories were a holy shade, crawling up along wrought iron trellises, bumping against damp shingles of Ohio roofs, and Oakland might as well have been the moon or farther. Um, and during the, my tenure streak, um, a lot of weird people ended up in my poems. I don't know why. I, I'm not going to try and analyze it. It's dangerous. You know a lot of weird people. <laughs> I do, but they're mostly celebrities, and, and, and they're easy. They're easy cultural touchstones. Um, in this particular one, uh, it's Neil Armstrong made a, made an appearance. So, ladies and gentlemen, Neil Armstrong. <laughs> the very same thing. I was not quite two when you walked on the moon. My mother, three months pregnant with my brother, lifted me into that bold night. She whispered into my wild ear and told me that you, Neil Armstrong, were a god among gods. She told me to scratch the light in front of me, told me that I will always have moon dust under my nails, told me that this world should never be enough for me, told me that every mother on this planet was whispering the very, the very same thing in every language on this planet. That was a mother poem. I guess this is going to be a father poem. Um, huh. All right. A half century of gathering omens prepared me for this. When I was a smaller version of the human I am now, my grandmother stopped breathing on the day Jesus was born. We knew there would be no rising from the tomb for her, so we wept and hid our, here, hid our tears beneath the pine needles. I convinced, my I convinced myself that my skin was the worst four-leaf clover, that I was the unluckiest charm. When my father pulled the only magic trick he knew, vanishing into thin air without either of his faithful assistants, and disappeared himself into the desert for 40 years, I was not surprised by the phone call reporting his death, only by the day on which it fell. Um, yeah, so. This one, yeah, this one, um, is a father poem. My father was a cop. And when you grow up in a household where the cop is the primary figure in the household, it gives you the possibility of a very splintered perspective. You either become very pro-police or you see the bullshit behind the thin blue line. I'm, I'm going to read this one and, and let you make your own minds up as to where I stand. This poem is for Jalen Walker. The Summer of Bunting. The world was red, white, and blue in the summer that I was 10. The Summer of Bunting. The Summer of New York Yankees. The Summer of RC Cola and Metal Cans. The Summer of Battle of the Network Stars. The Summer of 200s. The Summer of Bicentennial. The Summer that my brother found out he was asthmatic and that the desert heat, help, desert heat might help him breathe. The summer that my family moved from Cleveland to Phoenix. The summer that I met Amy Babcock. The summer that I saw Sean Cassidy posters on Amy Babcock walls. The summer that I wanted to be Sean Cassidy. The summer that my father reached into the back seat while driving and smacked me because I was singing the Kiki D part instead of the Elton John part. The summer that my father marched me into the Arizona desert to teach me how to shoot his gun. Peach fuzz still fresh on my nuts, sweat in my eyes, and my elbows locked. I wildly fired his 45 while he marshaled around leather chested, refusing to sweat under the bake of that automatic sun. He made me shoot at everything. Reader's Digest condensed novels, his empty Coors cans, worn out tires, my plastic cowboys and their frozen gunfighter stances, and a football helmet I refused to use. Even the occasional cactus or gopher. It didn't matter. His eyes saw nothing but targets. One Saturday, sights set on me. He bellowed, put your shirt back on. I don't want to listen to your mother, bitch, when you start peeling like a goddamn Gila monster. And pay attention to what you're doing. If you're not careful, you're going to put a hole in my chest the size of Tucson. I didn't yet know that red, white, and blue could be neatly folded into a triangle and placed upon a casket. I didn't yet know that Clint Eastwood was the first last breath in the death of Lady Justice, that Dirty Harry would become the unquestioned law of the land, that a sneer and a revolver and a squint and a badge would become precedent, that guilt could be seen through the crosshairs, that skin could become a trigger. Uh -huh. Thank you. 
And these last four poems are from my chapbook, 13 Ways of Looking at Lou Reed, which was obviously influ influenced by Lou Reed, but was less influenced by Lou Reed than it was by Wallace Stevens and his work, 13 <laughs> Ways of Looking at a Blackbird. Wallace um, Reed. Yeah, well, um, nobody told the ladybugs. No remote for the hotel te television. Muffled voice next door falls somewhere between Lou Reed and firing pin. Front desk clerk mentions a tornado in the next state, but nobody told the ladybugs that two dozen ladybugs stuck to the window, <laughs> smeared so thick with soap that they must be confusing it for the flat side of a cloud. All of their vocals. The fuzz guitars do not sing hallelujah for you, Lou Reed. The singers are asleep in the garden and have forgotten their lines. All of their vocals have been overdubbed, walked upon, set into an infinite loop. Impossible to tell. Psychedelic rust, lunar aftermath, amplified, amplified, and after the 11th time, it becomes impossible to tell whether Lou Reed is saying Lisa says or Jesus saves. <laughs> vending machine profiteers. Loud are the vending machine profiteers, one quarter, one quarter, one quarter, clank, 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 into the cracks in the armor, into the empty, into the Lou Reed skyline above a city he never saw. Loud are the boys and girls yelling in their nylon ripcord vocals. Loud are the raw and childish voices of the new silence. Orbit. The meat birds circle wide tonight. Their bones are hollowed with flight, and their bills should be hooked with prey. They are hungered. They are unaware. They do not understand orbit. They, do not, they cannot verbalize trajectory. They do not know satellite amour. They do not know Lou Reed but they can sense his rotting bones. And for those of you who know um, a little bit of history about Lou Reed, before he passed, um, he did have to have his liver replaced. Um, and it was at a hospital here in Cleveland. Um, this one's titled Wild Side. Lou Reed flew into the city of Rust in one plane yellowed. His liver arrived on another, and he snuck out of there, a transformed fellow, but not until after the anesthetist said count backward from two, 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 That's it. Thank you very much. All right. So for the first one tonight, uh, the open mic, we have Ed Almond. Welcome, Ed, please. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'll have to throw down some reruns because I ain't been writing much. This is from a couple of years ago. The dark of winter hangs around me. I dream a sunny Spanish scene. I can't speak the language. It's a place I've never been. Old men sit playing dominoes on the sunny street, I dream. Not at all like winter here, where the rats have stole the cream. As this country spirals down, every day it seems more happiness is stolen by the clown. <laughs> Thank you. Just a memory. I don't even know when this is from. Elma, what was that? My barefoot, suntanned, six-year-old self asked his grandmother. It was so fast, just a flash, brightest yellow like Vince's airplane. Vince was my father, named for Stephen Vincent Benet, but we all called each other by first names in my family. I remember the goldfinch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll throw this down even though it scares me. This one's <laughs> Panic! Too many heartbeats. Running, running, which way now? This is a fox hunt. Have I been mistaken for the fox? Running, running, which way now? More hounds in the chase, or bullets next? Mm -hmm. And I'll leave you with that. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Ed. Okay. All right, Ed. Thank you. Next up on the open mic, we have Steve Goldberg. Yay! Oh, Steve. Steve Goldberg. Please, most of you don't even know who I am. 
And when I'm done, you won't want to admit it. <laughs> you can only go up from here, right? First of all, I want to just kind of say, great job, Steve. I look forward to listening to Teresa. Uh, I've been fans of theirs for many, many years. Uh, poor Steve has been, in my mind, when I was judging the Hessler Street uh, Poetry Contest, I had him as number one. He should have won. Everything's pointed it should be one that he should have won, and he didn't. And a big ripoff, and my girlfriend was part of the other committee, <laughs> and she told me what went on in the behind the scenes. It's like a bunch of Republicans judging poetry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm allowed to do that here. I know in Lake County I get hurt. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to do a couple of poems, a couple, some short ones, basically over the last uh, year or so. Um, I've been working a lot at home, so when I sit when I sit down, um, it's like I feel like I'm at work. So you know, when I'm tapping on my computer, it doesn't have that right feel. So I call these proto poems for me to look at later. So they're a little bit rough. I want to start off. Um, I'm at that age where you know friends start start dying off, and uh, this past year has been quite a few. Um, and so this is one I, I did for. Uh, my friend uh, Lou Block. Ever so independent, needing nothing from anybody, picking who he will spend time with, now dead in his home, I hope on his own terms. But what if it wasn't? Who could he tell? Who could he tell but the echoes of his collapse? My dad, we cheer things up a little bit. Um, is a relatively old one. Advice. Write while drunk, revise while sober. Somebody important said that once. He had a beard, I think. I shaved mine off long ago. Wow, that's a keeper. I don't have to do anything to that one. I like this crowd. I like this crowd. That's a good one, though. That's a keeper. Pursuit of happiness. Pooping. <laughs> Pimple popping. Dead skin peeling. Blowing a big loogie out my nose. Peeing. Slow sips. Multiple <laughs> mastication. Pulling stray nose or ear hair. Close shave after a week's neglect. That's me. It's all me. A hearty ball scratch. Also me. Stretch out in the grass on a sunny day, sniffing spring air just as garden flowers open. The snuggle, either with man or beast. Mm -hmm. And he's next to um, is where I do my book whoring. I have a book too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have copies if anybody wants any. All and right. you do. It's my first like big one. So uh, I always had this idea about all the great poets and how they all seemed to know each other, and they were called schools, and they were like the New York School or the Beats or 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 the or the the Black Mountain or language. And I always was fascinated how all these classic, well-known poets all seemed to know each other, and they seemed to know each other before they became famous. Mm -hmm. And I was always thinking, because uh, Northeast Ohio is just loaded, mm -hmm. loaded with really great poets. And I've, I've, I've right. helped showcase some of them to some of my friends from around the country, other poetry uh, uh, festivals, um, and you know, they, they, they acknowledge these guys are good. And I always thought that there would be some sort of like Ohio school. And I always, you know, do you plan that? So this one's called, this is the, uh, uh, the title uh, poem, History is an Afterthought. We get together at first to listen to each other's words at an open mic or a workshop. We glean like from a wheat field the essence of what is important, what makes each of us tick if we are honest. 
We all have bullshit detectors so sensitive no one gets by. We know each other and we hang with each other. Most of all, we like each other and we talk. Talk of poetry, of course. Talk of personal importance. Talk of social ills and what we would change if we were more than just poets. We would share stories outside of our writings, of writers we know or have not. Some are famous or were famous, or only famous in their neighborhood. Pictures of us hanging together at a restaurant or a bar, or at a reading of an influence. We don't care. We only love the word and each other. But sometimes, as books of literary history are perused, and pictures of the now famous are scrutinized, did the, que the question is begged. Did they know they would be a school? Did they know they would be famous? Did they know? We don't know. But do we care? Mm -hmm. yes. It's so hard for me to like do this without like having beer. It's, it's, oh, I'm not. I'm not asking. Yeah, you're but also my, not turning Steve, down. Steve, Steve Reitman is my enabler. Everybody sees that. <laughs> And so for my last one, it's uh, maybe more of a confessional. It's called procrastination, something I do really, really well. Rainy Sunday mornings are made for poetry reading in a lounge chair. Not the famous ancient poets of civilization building as teachers and professors adjudicated for yawning adolescents and forced indoctrination sections sessions, chained to desks without room for modern knees. No, Sunday mornings are for friends' words, acquaintances met once at a show with beer or espresso or both, or for names recognized or recommended by the wise street educated, poems about dreams, blood, death, love, and the opposite of love, silence interrupted by sips of coffee, the pit-pat of errant raindrops on a window, the occasional fart or chuckle or both. <laughs> a world where words are simultaneously seen with images of mundane living room clutter and imagined vignettes of fancy may be blurred by empathetic tear, whether of grief or of joy. Reading in comfort in order to be uncomfortable. Reading to rediscover the kick in the gut and hunger of emptiness. And, to feel the, and feel the need to stop procrastinating. The responsible conscience whispering at a waist between page turns says to get dressed and get ready for chores. Grudgingly, the book is closed, but the lessons are remembered. But the already put off chores can wait a bit longer for you to finish writing in a fresh new notebook, proud to use procrastination to fight procrastination. <laughs> Thank you all. All right, so I will read a couple pieces too. I planned for one. Right. Thank you. Thank you. There's only three of us for open mic, so I will read a second one as well. Thank you. Get that angry cow out. <laughs> yeah. This one's not angry. The next one's going to be angry. Uh, <laughs> so I just got back from spending time with my aunt and watching Alzheimer's uh, rip through another relative, which is painful experience as, as many of you are aware of. And so that made us, I'm glancing on what else I'm going to do here. I'm going to read this poem. Um, but yeah, we're just, easy, simple things become complicated, memories of who people are become complicated. So this piece is called Empty Weight. The weight of the casket burdens my teenage arm how can it feel both heavy and empty at the same time? How diabetes and gangrene and medical malpractice took piece by piece from him until the weight of nothing strained my arm. Consciousness, consciousness now missing like my grandfather's leg, like his toes on both feet before that, like my memories of him walking on two legs. A single chase up the stairs as I ran helplessly from punishment, the only time I could remember him moving without a walker, without a wheelchair, without scooting up the stairs on his behind. Now instead of pushing his wheelchair, I was carrying his casket. Instead of losing to him in checkers, I was losing him. 
His active mind and failing body, the counterpart to my grandmother's active body and failing mind. A team who had already lost a leg, now lost the only mind Alzheimer's had bothered to spare. A team who at that point could only function in tandem. Like how I couldn't carry this casket without my cousins. When we set the casket down, I will still have two arms, but there will be only one seat on this tandem bike. The tires still spin, but the handlebar has fallen off, leaving the lone rider drifting aimlessly through a path of obstacles they will no longer understand. She's got the greatest fashion sense. Yeah, <laughs> that is perfect. Danielle, we are actually on the open mic part. If you want to read tonight, you can go right, I'm the last reader, and you can go right after. We got one more, and then you know, come on up here, read us something if you would. Okay. You're willing well, to treat us. Yet. Danielle, for those of you who are not here, was the first feature last month. Okay. Uh, While you do that, I'm going to read one last piece. All right. <laughs> Have a minute to figure out what you're going to read. The darkness of dawn's early light. America, land of the free, home of the incarcerated, where we pretend not to notice the contradiction. America, where we cling to the Second Amendment while firing rubber bullets and tear gas at the first. America, where we continue to idolize slave owners and cruel coloniers, colonizers, yet laugh at the thought that racism might still exist. America, home of the homeless. Those cast aside, not worthy of a fucking sandwich. There are too many hungry billionaires to feed, mouths bloody from the carcasses of the former middle class. So we avert our gaze from the poor, the hungry, the sodden souls trapped beneath the heavy boot of society's indifference, leaving their bodies to slowly rot in the streets. America, a name encompassing two entire continents, yet we still think it belongs solely to us. America, hating our neighbors while cradling our Bibles tightly like the elusive embryos we will cease to care for the moment they make their watery exits from the birth canal. Ooh. America where the claim to be the greatest is left conveniently untangled from the messiness of reality. Thanks for allowing me to read on. You ready, Danielle? You got something? I, I think I found something. You got all kinds of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, a fantastic honor to uh, have one more addition to the open mic. We have Danielle Nicole Nikki Dixon. So it was a, you know, uh, you know, you got here. Yeah, you know, I, I couldn't miss it. You know, fashion. But late. Steve was so amazing. <sighs> Best reading he's ever done in his career. Oh, man. <laughs> he's coming back though, right? It's okay. <laughs> There's <Man>. video. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Well, here's the first one that popped up. So I'm gonna go with this if I can get it to open up. Okay, there we go. All right, uh, I did this one the last time, so some of you might have heard this one already. Uh, hey Google, how do you care for a boyfriend? <laughs> do they come with tags on the insides of their t-shirts that say how much water and sunlight they need? <laughs> do I have to talk nicely to them like my houseplants? And oh my god, what do they eat? How often is it better to pick one in spring or fall? <laughs> And how do I test for ripeness? Do I tap his belly like a watermelon and listen for the hollow? <laughs> if mine has not reached maturity, can I set him on a sunny windowsill with my tomatoes until he's ready? There you go. Is there a boyfriend hunting season? <laughs> do I need a license or a permit? <laughs> do we keep them indoors or is it more humane to let them be free range? <laughs> and how does one keep 
a free range boyfriend from wandering in through the neighbor's back door. <laughs> Do you know how pissed I'll be if I put all this effort into a boyfriend and he shacks up at the neighbor's? <laughs> I already know not to get them wet after midnight. <laughs> That's how you make gremlins. And those do not come housebroken. And I don't want to end up in jail for parental neglect when little strike burns the fucking city down. So maybe I'll just stay single. It's safer that way. Damn <laughs> I'll give you a hint, we age like avocados. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a very narrow window. <laughs> That's a new poem right there. <laughs> okay, uh, well here's one. Um, I actually wrote this one. It's in a publication from Lit Cleveland. Mm -hmm. I think it's called The Neighborhood Voices, mm -hmm. Volume 2. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's it. Uh, this one is called Sunday Service. Barbecue smoke signals summon Sunday sinners from their slumber. Today, backyard is church. No one is formally invited, but everyone will come through. All are welcome in this sanctuary. Come as you are. The gospel of rhythms dusts our blues. We take communion. Deviled eggs are the body. And the blood, V.O. in red solo. <laughs> <laughs> Parishioners bring side dish offerings, lay them along the altar. Those who can't cook bring plates, cups, and ice. <laughs> Others bring themselves, their love and laughter. Every offering is just enough. There will be spades and tonk for the kids, but bit whist is grown folks biz. Half stepping, rise and fly, slapping cards and telling lies. Turn to your neighbor, say neighbor. It's sacrilegious to renege in this house. We commiserate, feed our faces and slap our thighs when we laugh from the gut. We pour one out for our dearly departed. Our time here is short, so we hug necks and kiss cheeks in this fellowship. There is always a two-go plate wrapped in foil. Guests take what they need from the bag of bags under the kitchen sink. The sun bleeds orange across the Mount Pleasant skyline. The, how, uh, the breeze carries music and laughter on the wind. We know these are the best days of our lives. This is the day the Lord hath made. Let the church say amen. 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 stage next, Teresa Gattel Brightman. Her poems have appeared in many online and print publications, just two chapbooks, one full-length collection called Stretching the Window. She has received awards from the University of Akron, the City of Ventura, among others, and has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize, the Eisling Award, Best of the Net Awards, some amazing stuff. She lives in Akron with her husband, Steve Brightman, our first feature tonight, and the Green Bird, who owns them both. And then I will mention... When I was teaching at Kidder, Kidron Elementary, Teresa came in and spoke to the fourth graders and performed for the fourth graders, and she had them engaged and involved, and they were clapping and stomping, and she gave them things to do to be not just audience members, but participants. She made them poets in that moment, and at the end of that set, the fourth graders at Kidron Elementary lined up to get Teresa's autograph. Please welcome to the stage, Teresa Gottel Brightman. Everything out there, everything, 
even their words. Do not join the posturing of a strong man swindle contest, swinging a farcically oversized maudlin mallet. This game, I promise you, this game is rigged. You cannot ring the bell at the top of the pole, no matter your strength or speed. Don't play, you will always lose. The poets, the brimstone end is near sackcloth and sandwich sign mendicant poets, Idealists in their eggshell castles, weaving lace out of the spun spit of angels. The poets say that a word can change the world. But when you swallow the hate bait, an addict jonesing for the verbiage of outrage, every pore of the skin a microscopic mouth with microscopic teeth gnashing in the three trillion voices, the value of your word depreciates. Wasted in a bunker-busted void land, you will lose your words, little sister, little brother. A word brought you into this world, and a word will precede your leaving every syllable seated in Brokaw's area before migrating south to your lips is a choice. Choose the nest of eggs or the fire. Choose the bread or the knife. Choose the tree or the engine, but choose with ration and parse. Do not spend your words, open wallets and flashy build folds, spilled like small change in cheap liquor and cheaper ammunition. Avoid sloshing through that sewage baptism, throwing spears in the name of a bloody tooth god. Everyone, little brother, wants a god-sanctioned war. Everyone, little sister, wants god validation for us and a god condemnation for them. The name of god, no god. Not even the gods in justice and liberty and decency and equality. The name of no god can be used to justify violence. Peace alone is holy. Peace alone is holy. Thank you. And hello, Internet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and say hello to the Internet. So, uh, Steve and I have a hedge along the side of our driveway, and it has cypress trees growing in it, but there's one tree that we knew didn't belong there, and last year, for the first time, we've been in this house for six years now, uh, last summer, for the first time, it had berries on it, and I was like, those are mulberries. We, didn't, we had a mulberry tree growing next to our driveway, and we didn't even know what it was. Um, but the way it's grown and the way it's been trimmed so that you could use the driveway, um, there's no way you can possibly reach the berries. So it's only for the squirrels and the birds, and like the ch there's no chance of um, us ever getting them, which kind of seems appropriate. And I wrote this poem, Apology to the Mulberry Tree. I know you don't belong here in the crush between two driveways planted by the magical chance of squirrel or bird dropping, a volunteer sister woven in the cypress hedge with a crown betraying your misfit status. I'm sorry for this inhospitable place constricting you to grow tall and narrow and twisting to avoid shears rather than low and spreading with ease deep boughs heavy with gifts of tea leaves and fruit. You were not made for this world into which you were born, and I'm sorry I didn't see you, really see you, until this spring. You screamed your divinity, calling down your patron goddess, erupting sugary illuminated bulbs for the first time, flushing white to pink to red, and lining your crossroads bridge from this profane earth to the heavens. My holy friend, I am sorry this place was man-marked before I was born, determining the constricted direction of your existence it's only fair your branches remain out of reach, that only the jays and the squirrels benefit from your gifts. And I'm sorry I won't be able to keep you safe forever, that someday your roots will crack a sewer main, or your branches stretch too close to a power line, and people will decide that your life is not worth inconvenience. You don't deserve this. But for today, my holy broken guardian, I pledge you peace. I pray that before anyone decides your life is unsustainable, that we who made it so will have learned to harmonize and correct, to give us all a chance to thrive free. This is not the season of summer. 
This is the season of wildfires. This is the season of flash flooding. This is the season of hurricanes. This is the season of tornadoes. This is the season of monsoons and rain rainforests. This is the season of hailstorms. This is the season of being chased by a famous game show host through the moldy moss castle passages. This is the season when you are a chemistry expert, so you toss the lit nubs of homemade TNT sticks back at the famous game show host as you flee his horde of black-suited intelli-ops. This is the season when you are holding the secret they need. This is the season when you smuggle an antique glass eye carefully sculpted of crystal and once owned by a millionaire gangster bootlegger. This is the season you hold the hammer that drove the final golden spike into the final tie of the transcontinental railroad. This is the season you carry a vial of snake venom to kill Loki's bastard wolf, Ragnarok, wolf of Ragnarok, eight-legged and heavy-furred, faster than arrowheads mounted on lightning bolts. This is the season Season for pushing off from your heels and floating invisible through the stony network of passages and into the light. This is the season of heroes. This is the season for hiding until the time to strike back. This is the season of bindweed, climbing counterclockwise to smother the crops and the trees and the flowers. This is the season of machetes and hedge trimmers, scythes and sickles, of sharpening blades and firing torches. This is the season for those with the name of Reaper. This is the season for building blimps, the flying behemoth guardians, the impossible rhinoceros of happiness whose sightings bring good fortune in a rainy, prosperous year. This is the season for building common ground across fault lines and stretching frayed ends to meet. This is the season of bottle flies mating and bronze bells chiming and chipmunks using downspouts as a subway. This is the season of gargoyles melting like ice cream and of sleeping through your greatest Pulitzer, Nobel, Man Booker novel. This is the season the world is ending. When masked rebels carve dollar signs into mango bright eyes, this is the season for climbing to stand on the parapet, spreading your arms and knowing that not the net, but your wings will appear. I am going to read a couple from uh, the chapbook that I have with me. <laughs> this is called Following the Stagecoach Trail. These two lost seabirds floating over marsh and vale defy the playground swing sets that call after them. The river is too high, darling, too high today, too high for a 10 or a 15 year song. But since, but they're too busy fighting giants and stacking river stones into pious little gnomes and collections of parables. They carefully pick their steps along the prayer chain, climbing embankments and carrying a little bit of river in their shoes. And I've always liked to keep a little bit of river in my own shoes. There's nothing more to worry about, not here between the rusted smokestack lullabies and the confined almond groves, nothing but the next step, waiting for the apples to fall, although they never do. They turn around at number five, tracking mud and pipes and drums into the shrine, leaving ears of corn on the altar and watching a silver lady in the field, her head pulled back, facing the stars. Bridges. I wonder if they burned the bodies. After stealing the wings from their backs, peeling off those sightless cloves of color and light, I want to ask if they burned the bodies. Ghost miners hammer the tail feathers of doves out of scrap aluminum, gray like the stories he used to tell. But I wanted to live on a street called Imagine with the vernacular of soul sculptures tapping on the windows. And after the windows would shatter, they'd crawl, flightless and afraid of God, but at least they had something to fight against while throwing bits of monarchs at paper clouds in a paper sun. My spine melted, a candle burning a kite of red silk that never left the ground except as smoke. He touched my left shoulder blade and asked about the scars where the wings used to be. I'm sure they're mounted on someone's wall or hanging around a duchess's neck by now. Gazing down between concrete girders and half-rusted gratings, I miss those wings. Skipping over the gaps between nature and man, the intersection where a city professes its love for a cold black river. And for the first time, I feel beautiful again. And now for something completely different. <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, disclaimer, this was written before uh, the, our 45th president was elected. So when you hear his name, you can, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they said there would be money. They said you were sitting on Martha's Vineyard, Trump Tower, and the Skywalker Ranch all rolled into one. They said you'd draw on hundred dollar bills and spit golden nuggets. They said wouldn't you buy a ticket if you were guaranteed to win the lottery? They said your subdivision was the Middle East of the Midwest and that you could be the Sheik of Shale. They said your heating bill would be free for the rest of your life. They said this would save the rotting rust belt grease the joints of this frozen industrial machine. They said this is about helping struggling families through the recession. They said this is your responsibility as an American. They said God blessed you with this half acre lot and to not sign is to wag your blasphemous middle finger at the Lord and Savior. You don't want America dependent on those Saudi terrorists, do you? They said, we've used this technology since 1947, but nobody's complained about it till now. They said, those fractivists don't really care about your water. They're just a bunch of manatee-hugging manatee socialists trying to overturn the American way of life. They said, your 401k hasn't been doing well. They said, do you still have two kids in college? They said, your wife just got laid off. They said, that old minivan in your driveway is, what, at 98? They said, this is the best deal you're going to get. They said, all your neighbors already signed. They said, they'd take it even if you didn't sign and give you nothing. They said, you might just be a little dust and noise. They said, it was safe. They said, natural gas was clean energy. They said, they'd done hundreds of studies. They said, the processed water waste pits were EPA approved. They said, the fish in the stream could have died from anything. They said methane was naturally occurring and could have come from anywhere. They said the wells couldn't be inspected thousands of feet underground. They said nobody's perfect. They said the radon was already in your house. They said you had the flu when you and your daughter couldn't stop vomiting for two months. They said contamination was impossible. They said your well water was perfectly safe. They said no thank you when you offered them a glass of your well water. They said it was nothing when the cat and dog started losing their hair and half the cattle died. They said it was nothing when they evacuated your family at 4 a.m. with fumes clawing at your eyes and throat. They said it was nothing when the neurologist and oncologist bills came. They said nothing when you showed them your brown jar of money when the sinks and faucets were stuffed with dollar bills and you asked what you were supposed to drink. Now they said nothing. They said name your price. I've Everyone has a price. They said they'd exchange a blank check for the bloody stump of your tongue. They said you'd better get a lawyer. They said you didn't read the fine print. They said everything was legal. They said everything was permitted. They said natural gas was clean. So why are your hands so dirty? Come on now. To the Supreme Court. <laughs> oh, yeah. sea turtles, and 11 species of birds declared extinct in 2021. We are paying for gas with wildfires, hurricanes, floods, droughts, and famines. We are paying for gas with the entire nations of Tuvalu, Micronesia, Kiribati, Bora Bora, Tahiti, Vanuatu, the Philippines, Grenada, the Marshall Islands, the Maldives, Palau, Fiji, Seychelles, Solomon Islands, Cape Verde, the Canary Islands, the Canary Islands in Spain, Torres Strait Islands in Australia, Tangier Island, Virginia, Hatteras Island, North Carolina, and the island of Shishmaref, Alaska. We are paying for gas with a sustainable food supply with tomatoes, spinach, lettuce, asparagus, romaine, bell peppers, oranges, strawberries, and bananas. We are paying for gas 
with rivers, and the endangered river salmon gasping in the mud, dried lake beds and with mineral rings at their lowest point, empty aquifers and water rationing. We are paying for gas with our natural wonders, the glaciers, the icebergs, the old growth forests, the snow-capped mountains, the oceans teeming with life, the rainforests, the waterfalls, the rolling coastlines. We are paying for gas with winter with snowmen and icicles and sledding and skiing, we are paying for gas with the glory of waking up to a winter morning world in silent, pristine white. We are paying for gas with human bodies as the vulnerable in Texas freeze, the vulnerable in Oregon suffocate, the vulnerable in Vancouver drown. We are paying with political unrest as people fight over the last food, the last water, and the last livable places on the planet. The bodies will pile up in war, in conflict, in unnatural disaster. We are paying for gas with the next, with the next generation's future. Um, I got the title of this uh, from our uh, councilwoman, uh, Nancy Holland. Um, a few years ago, uh, she posted something on Facebook after yet another shooting about how there should be a list for what we do on the day after terrorism. List for the day after terrorism. Look left, look right, look left again. Exercise caution. Watch for cars, watch for germs, watch for dogs. Watch for a burning rock of iron falling from the sky. Watch for unattended luggage. Watch for suspicious activity. Watch for false prophets trumpeting the end of the republic. Be safe. Pick the platitudes from the gaps between your teeth. They have been lodged there since Oklahoma City, since Columbine, since 9-11, Sandy Hook, Chardon, the Boston Marathon, Pulse, San Bernardino, Charleston, Las Vegas, Uvalde, since yesterday. They are lodged in bulletproof backpacks and bomb squad, kindergarten and the body armor, Bibles, remove them. Send your blood and money instead of your thoughts and prayers, keep your thoughts. Spend quiet hours transmuting them from cheap wine into holy blood, keep your prayers, pray for absolution from sins of complacency, from tongue click and obligatory single tear. Always heed traffic light red, traffic light green, traffic light caution yellow. They are blinking sunflowers, turning to face the light. Always warning sunflower, caution yellow, sunflower, caution yellow, sunflower, caution yellow. Be safe. Question this shell casing crucifix of an empty messiah. Reject all denominations of the kill cult. Write every name of the beloved and living. Make a mark for every being you meet, every partner to your personal struggle for survival. Remember, caution is a symptom of fear. Demand love. Find a bird. Remember the unlikely resilience of feathered things, glass-thin skeletons and bodies filled with air that somehow persist through the glittering violence of a man-shaped world. Chart the stars on a napkin, a receipt across your chest, on the back of your quarterly 401k report, make vellum from the skin on the back of your right hand and use it with water and palm fronds to fight the mystery of evil. Follow the rules of oil, acid, and incense. Take a fury broken and shared into blessings. Demand love. Take your body of ratcheting gears and latches, a machine of cotton and iron. Stuff the sternum with ravens of thought and memory, oil slick feathers and a sugar burn. Stretch your arms. Share debts and leprosy and shame. Share fear and bankruptcy in the colors of the enemy. Share the broken brass and asbestos angels perched above your door. Stay mindful of your daily elections. Demand love. When you fall short, begin again. the same arguments that people use for and against guns are used for and against abortion. Mm -hmm. Banned. Abortions don't kill people, people kill people. Only a good guy with an abortion can stop a bad guy with an abortion. 
Our schools will be safer if teachers have abortions. If they don't use an abortion, they'll use something else. In countries where abortions are banned, people will use, a, will use poison, a knife, a bomb. It's not an abortion problem. It's a mental illness problem. Abortions are necessary for self-defense. If you start banning some abortions, eventually the government will take away all abortions. Abortions prevent tyranny. If you ban abortions, only the criminals will have abortions. Abortion laws don't deter crime. Abortion ownership does. Citizens with abortions can help the authorities take down criminals and terrorists. More abortion control is unnecessary because relatively few people are killed by abortions. Abortion control will not prevent accidental abortion deaths. We need education about abortions and abortion safety to prevent accidental abortion deaths. The abortion is part of the American way of life. Abortion possession is too widespread to be reversed. The right to have an abortion is protected by the Constitution. There's no such thing as an assault abortion. Don't talk about abortion control when you can't even get your facts straight. The president said, the last president, I will get rid of abortion-free zones on schools, and you have to, on military bases. My first day, it gets signed, okay? My first day, there's no more abortion-free zones. Mm. starting this wonderful series, and I hope you have many wonderful years to come. Everybody check out Danielle's video from last month. Woo! <laughs> Naming ceremony. Mm. Once upon a time, when the world was new, and the ground was fire, and the sky was thick with star gas and light, the earth fresh from creation's passage through a canal of plasma and violence, she opened her mouth to sing. Her skin cooled and the oceans dropped from hydrogen clouds to set her axis spinning in song, a dervish worship, the terrestrial hymn praising primordial backscatter, um. As sand fuses into glass, into razor split atoms, as pressure transmutes leaf rot into coal, into crystals, as electric bolt leaves a zap of ozone and amino acids curled into respiration and photosynthesis, as skeletons metamorphose after a land breath hiccup into lunar effervescent opal, as the universe unceasingly creates Earth's core pumps magma molten iron into the rhythmic expansion and contraction, a ubiquitous heartbeat and thrum, wrapping stone and water into flesh and fins and scales, bone and leaves, bark and stems and claws, exoskeletons, feathers, calcium, magnesium, zinc and copper, fibers, vessels, proteins, all unified in this green, brown, blue homeland, percussing and strumming the energies of existence. We all sing her earth song of life. And your name is Earthquake Nation. Your name is Tectonic Culture. Your name is Crown of Flames. Your name is Sleeping Caldera. Your name is Igneous Rebellion. Your name is Howling Forests. Your name is glacier in opposition. Your name is love of the earth. Your name is love of the earth. Your name is love. That was a uh, request by Steve. <laughs> I'm not going after Teresa. Um, fantastic. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Another round of applause for Teresa Galloway and Steve If you like what you heard tonight, please tell a friend. Amazing features coming every month. If you missed last month, as Teresa mentioned, Danielle's feature was fantastic. It's available online.